Hi, my name is Dan and I'm a mental health pharmacist and today I will be presenting on eating disorders. I have five major objectives that I want to cover today and the presentation won't be broken up by these specific objectives but rather by the individual eating disorders. And you'll see what I mean as we get into the presentation. But the five major objectives are as follows. So first, I want to recognize the symptoms associated with three specific eating disorders, with those being anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder. Then we will define the diagnostic criteria based on the DSM-5. And DSM-5 is short for Diagnostics and Statistical, Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition. And this is the most current edition of the DSM that's used nationwide to diagnose mental health disorders. The third objective will be to explain medical complications and symptoms associated with each type of eating disorder. Then we will recommend, recommend treatments for the eating disorders. So whether that be pharmacologic treatment or non-pharmacologic treatment. And then the final objective is to recognize when hospital, hospitalization is recommended for the patients. So I will go into the three major eating disorders one by one. So anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder. But I wanted to start with an overall view of eating disorders to set the scene a little bit. So I, first I wanted to provide some historical content, um, context. So there are re reports of anorexia since the Middle Ages. So this is not a current phenomenon caused by social media or anything like that. Although social media use may worsen eating disorders, um, like I was saying, anorexia has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Next historical component I wanted to talk about was the DSM. So the DSM was created um, to standardize the diagnosing of mental illnesses across the country. So for example, when you look at something like diabetes or hypertension or something like that. There's objective measures that we can get to diagnose these illnesses. So you can take someone's blood pressure and see what it is, or you can take an A1C or see what their blood sugar is. But with mental disorders, mental illnesses, that's not the case. You're basing your diagnos diagnosis off of what the patient is telling you. So the first DSM was created to standardize what these diagnoses are across the country. So Hopefully, if you present to a hospital in California with certain symptoms or you present to a hospital in New Jersey with certain symptoms, hopefully you end up with the same diagnosis. The first edition of the DSM came out in um, 1952 called the DSM-1, or just DSM, but it was the first edition at that point, and anorexia nervosa was included in this first edition. By the third edition in the 1980s, bulimia was added. And then in our newest edition, the DSM-5, binge eating disorder was added. There's additional eating disorders in the DSM, um, which we'll talk about briefly, but it won't be the focus of this presentation. So eating disorder is the overarching word for these disorders, but like we were talking about, there's different types of eating disorders. So the major three we'll be focusing on is anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder. That being said, um, there are additional eating disorders. So one's called pica or pica, which is persistent eating of non-nutritive foods. So paper, soap, hair, ice. I think there's a TLC show where they sometimes highlight people that have this behavior. There's rumination disorder, which is repeated unintentional regurgitation of food. There's avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which is kind of like a very severe selective eating disorder to the point where someone's foods that they like or will eat are so narrow that they're maybe not getting um, the proper nutrients that they require. Next, the next two are kind of like catch-alls. So other specified feeding or eating disorder or unspecified feeding or eating disorder is what you would diagnose someone if they don't meet these other major categories that we're talking about. Eating disorders are based on a disturbance in body image perception. So I was watching this show produced by the BBC and it was like a mini docu-series type of show. 
Um, and it was a reality, reality TV based show called How Matter You. And the point of this show was to have patients that had treated mental illness and patients without or people without mental illness all live in a house together and psychiatrists would observe them doing tasks and events and so on and try to pick out who had a mental illness and who didn't. And the point was to destigmatize mental illness and show that people with treated mental illness, no one could really tell that they had anything um, unless you specifically asked the person. But one of the events that the people had to do in this show was dress in like really tight um, spandex clothing and have a picture taken of them. They were then presented with a computer with a really stretched image of themselves, and their goal was to downsize the image back to where what was appropriate for what their body actually looked like. And it was, they found really interesting results. So every single person who did this, mental history of mental illness, no history of mental illness, kept their image more stretched than it should have been by a degree. But one person kept their image stretched 30% more than what their actual body looked like. The psychiatrist guessed that that person had a history of an eating disorder and they were actually correct. So the person who overestimated their true body size by the most actually did have a history of an eating disorder. The next point is, are eating disorders increasing? And that's really hard to determine. The overall um, diagnoses over the last two decades have remained relatively stable. So from that standpoint, potentially not. But it looks like when you break it down into various regions of the world, um, some areas did have uh, big increases in diagnosis of eating disorders. So example is China and Japan over a recent time period does have really big increases in eating disorder. This is a little surprising because there's certain risk factors for eating disorders that have been increasing. So urbanization of society, social media use, like we talked about before, social pressure, all can increase the risk of eating disorders. Next, I wanted to have a slide about the etiology. So this is, eating disorders are likely multifactorial and caused by a combination of many things. What likely happens is someone has a genetic risk to have an eating disorder, and then some event happens in their life, stress, abuse, trauma, anything, that causes these genes to be expressed. So it's likely a combination of genetic risk plus a stressor that causes those genes to be expressed that causes the eating disorders to manifest. So basically it's multifactorial and the causes of eating disorders are complicated. Next I wanted to touch into the pathophysiology. The first point here is decreased neurotransmitter production. So your um, diet includes proteins and proteins have amino acids in them, and your body uses amino acids to synthesize neurotransmitters, which are the chemical signalers, chemical messengers in your brain. So for example, if you eat a lot of protein, maybe you have some chicken and tofu and nuts or, or anything really, um, your body will get tryptophan from those amino acids. Your body will get phenylalanine. Your body will get tyrosine. And then with those amino acids, your body makes serotonin, norepinephrine and dopamine. So in someone with an eating disorder who is maybe going long periods of time without eating, without getting that protein in their diet, they're making less neurotransmitters. And this is one of the theories and one of the reasons why most psychiatric medications don't work in someone who's severely underweight. So if someone's severely underweight, they're not having that, that same level of neurotransmitters. So if you give that person, say, an antidepressant, like a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, those medications work by blocking the reuptake of serotonin so it stays in the synapse for longer and has a better chance to bind. But if your body doesn't have that serotonin to begin with, it, the medication can't keep that into the synapse. So you need that proper diet to make the neurotransmitters. Uh, the next point here is neurotransmitters. So there's decreased active metabolites of serotonin in people with eating disorders, which, which makes sense based on what we say, but there's based off of what I just said, but there's also 
um, alterations in serotonin binding. So people with eating disorders may have that genetic component to themselves where their serotonin binds differently. Also, there's dopaminergic dysfunction. So that's a part of the reward pathway. So in someone with an eating disorder, they might not get that same reward based on eating or um, feeling full or anything like that. So then their eating can be altered. Um, speaking of that, there's also altered blood flow to different areas in the brain in people with eating disorders. And there is a strong genetic association like we were saying. So the pathophysiology is really complicated too. There may be just less neurotransmitters to begin with, but even if the neurotransmitters are there, they may be binding and working differently in someone with eating disorders. And then there's genetic components. Next is comorbid conditions. So psychiatric comorbid conditions are very prevalent in someone with an eating disorder. So as you can see from the slide here, 55 to 90, 97% of patients diagnosed with an eating disorder also receive another psychiatric diagnosis. The most common is depression, or major depressive disorder, and a lot of the symptoms of depression and eating disorders overlap. So one of the questions they ask about in diagnosing depression is, have you had any changes in your appetite recently? Increased appetite, decreased appetite. And that can, of course, go along with eating disorders. Um, other symptoms of depression can be being socially withdrawn. And that's also associated with eating disorders. And then a depressed mood. So someone with an eating disorder alone could have a depressed mood. Next, and thought of a lot less than major depressive disorder, is that people with eating disorders have a high chance of OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder. And roughly 40% of people with eating disorders also have OCD. You'll see that there are OCD symptoms. So their obsessions and their compulsions um, in someone with an eating disorder are often related to food. So they might collect recipes and, and or hoard food, or there's another condition that's not officially recognized by the DSM called orthorexia, which is almost an obsession with healthy eating. So these people will comp compulsively check the labels and um, they'll cut out certain foods from their diets and they'll obsessively follow certain health food blogs and um, YouTube videos and so on. So uh, obsessive compulsive disorder um, and eating disorders are really closely linked. Next, um, anxiety disorders are also common in people with eating disorders and substance use disorders. And this isn't just someone using stimulants or Adderall or something like that to suppress appetite, but it can also be other um, substances. So remember, someone with an eating disorder often has less neurotransmitters or their neurotransmitters don't function the same way as other people. So their mood can be down and substances are a way that people try to change their mood and change the way they feel. So substance use disorders and eating disorders also are common together. Okay, so I hope that that helped set the scene um, for eating disorders. So we talked about some of the causes of eating disorders, some of the pathophysiology in the brain, and we talked about comorbid conditions and even some of the history with eating disorders. So now I wanted to go into anorexia nervosa to start, then we'll do bulimia, then we'll do binge eating disorder, and then we'll wrap up. So let's jump right into anorexia nervosa. So this first slide here is an overview of anorexia nervosa. So the major points I wanted to make here, anorexia nervosa is an intense fear of gaining weight. Uh, and people with anorexia nervosa have a significantly low body weight. So that's one of the defining features of anorexia is that significantly low body weight. So remember that. Prevalence is higher in females as compared to males. And you'll see that this is a repeating pattern as we talk about more eating disorders. The clinical course shows a peak age of onset in the late teens. And the average episode duration is eight months but the average duration of illness is for many years. So the person might have a long episode. So eight months is long. That's longer than most episodes of depression and mania and bipolar and so on. So eight months is a long time in the, the frame of mental illnesses, but they might have some improvement, some recovery, 
and then relapse into another acute episode for an eight month period. And that can happen for years and years. The bolded point here on the slide is that anorexia nervosa has the highest mortality of any psychiatric disorder. So someone who's hospitalized for anorexia, so their weight is so low um, that they need to be hospitalized, their mortality rate um, exceeds 10%. So those deaths can be due to starvation, cardiac arrest, suicide even, and then lower weight at presentation, longer duration of illness, and alcohol use also can contribute to raising that mortality rate. So this is something really serious, really um, important to treat appropriately. Next is the DSM-5 criteria. So this slide's a little busy, but this um, is the true diagnostic criteria for anorexia nervosa. And you can, of course, reference the DSM if you want to look further into this. But the points I have highlighted, restriction of energy intake, and then again, leading to a significantly low body weight. So that's one of the high mark or high highlights of anorexia. There's an intense fear of gaining weight and a disturbance in the way that one's body shape is experienced. So like we were talking about with the How Mad Are You TV show, people might think that they're bigger than they actually are in reality. There's different types of anorexia, so it can be a restrictive type where that person's just not taking in calories until they lose weight, or there can be a binge eating, but that purging component to the point where they're losing significant weight. And the severity is based on BMI. So BMI is a way to look at someone's weight relative to their height and someone who has extreme, um, someone who has extreme anorexia has a BMI of 15 or less. Next is signs and symptoms. So some behavioral behaviors that you might notice in someone with anorexia nervosa is that they might cut their food into really small pieces. They might chew each bite for an exceedingly long period of time. They might avoid certain meals like, oh, I don't normally eat breakfast or no lunch for me today or something along those lines. They may restrict their diet in certain ways. So, oh, I'm a vegetarian, I'm a vegan, I don't eat carbs, I'm doing keto, something like that where they can say that to people to help restrict what they're able to eat. Um, calorie counting or restricting and then ways to make themselves feel full when they're actually not, such as water loading, so drinking a ton of water. Some people will eat ice, not in like a pika sense, but in a sense to make them feel like they're eating something and to feel full. Uh, someone with an anorexia may weigh themselves multiple times per day, and they may misuse medications to help them lose weight. So that could be something like laxatives, diuretics, or enemas to help them to get rid of excess weight. Or it could be like we were talking about with Adderall or stimulants that suppress appetite, or it could be with diet aids. Next is the psychiatric manifestations of eating disorders. And as you can see, a lot of these are broad and can be a component of many mental illnesses. So social isolation and withdrawal, that can be, for example, a symptom of depression. Irritability, that can be a symptom of many mental illnesses. Ritualistic behaviors, that again overlaps with o excuse me, OCD. And then major depressive disorder and anxiety disorder are all things that can happen in anorexia, substance use disorders, um, and so on. Next is the physical manifestations, and this is what makes anorexia so fatal and so dangerous. So the body type you'll see in someone with anorexia, so one of the key characteristics is a low body weight, a low BMI. So the body type is underweight to emaciated. Um, gastrointestinal, so this person, people with anorexia can have slowed motility and severe constipation. So their body organs don't receive all the energy they need, so sometimes they can slow down. And then also, they slow their body slows down the food going through the system to try to absorb as many calories as they possibly can um, so that can cause constipation there's endocrine issues like cold intolerance uh, lethargy brittle nails there's dermatologic issues like dry skin and then something called lanugo which if you look at the picture on the right uh, lanugo is like a fine white hair that can cover the face or the body or grow in uh, areas where it normally doesn't. So the picture at the right 
you can kind of see along the cheek and the upper lip, there looks to be a, a fine hair, which is lanugo. Hyperkeratinemia, hyper, hyper so someone with anorexia can have like a yellowing, orangish of the skin. But the one of the biggest issues is the changes with electrolytes. So someone who's not taking in calories, not taking in food, often has low levels of electrolytes. So hypoglycemia, hypochloronemia, nitremia, kalemia, calcemia, magnesemia, a lot of them. But where this comes into play a lot is with something called refeeding syndrome. So refeeding syndrome is whenever you take someone who's severely underweight or starved for a long period of time, that person can't just feast or gorge or start eating a ton of food because that causes severe um, shifts in their fluid and electrolyte balances that can be fatal. So the way to prevent refeeding syndrome is that you have to introduce calories slowly into someone who's been effectively starved for a long period of time. They can't go from not eating um, for months and months to suddenly eating a, a lot of calories and a lot of food. Next, uh, there's hormonal changes. As the body doesn't have enough calories, um, there can be hypoestrogenic states, other hormones change as well. Another issue that can be fatal is the cardiac effects. So there can be cardiac muscle atrophy and electrocardiogram, uh, electrocardiogram changes, which again leads to that lethality of this disease. And then there's issues with the bones as well. So osteopenia, osteoporosis can occur. Next, I wanted to go into the treatment a little bit. And the first step with anorexia nervosa treatment is to decide the level of care necessary. So if someone's so underweight and having really low blood pressure, really low heart rate, really low electrolytes, this person needs to be hospitalized. Um, they're at risk for dying, for fatalities. So um, someone who's, like I said, a really low BMI, who's having those issues would need to be hospitalized. But someone who's not as sick can be treated in either an intensive outpatient, so out in the community, or completely outpatient. So that's the first thing that needs to be decided when someone presents with anorexia. The specific first line treatments include uh, nutritional re rehabilitation, which in this case would entail restoring weight at a controlled pace. So someone who's inpatient and hospitalized, you can check their electrolytes frequently, you have really close monitoring of their heart and so on, and that person can, you can restore two to three pounds per week. Someone who's treated outpatient, they're not monitored as closely, you would generally um, only try to restore roughly half a pound to a pound. You also want to, with the nu nutritional rehabilitation, normalize diet, normalize healthy eating behaviors, um, develop a meal plan, and so on. The next first line treatment is therapy. So therapy is, um, extremely effective for eating disorders, in this case, anorexia nervosa, it helps to overcome those distorted body images where you see yourself as bigger than you actually are. It helps with, again, one of the predisposing factors to eating disorders can be past traumas or abuse. So it helps to address those, the, those like deep seated issues. It teaches strategies to deal with stress and negative emotions rather than not eating and, um, it can also treat food phobias. So remember the first line treatment for anorexia nervosa is all non-pharmacologic, meaning not medicine based. It's nutritional rehab therapy. Next is the pharmacologic treatment. And as you'll see under the medical component, this is treating the symptoms from um, denying your body calories for a long period of time. So malnutrition can be treated on the outpatient basis with a multivitamin. Constipation with flaxseed or stool softeners, you don't want to use laxatives because, again, that's something that can be abused in this patient population. Next, you can treat abdominal bloating and pain, and you can treat osteopenia. Psychiatric medications are generally not effective in a severely malnourished, underweight patient. And we already talked about the um, theory and potential cause behind that. So if the person hasn't been eating for a long period of time, they haven't made serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine um, in, in the same amounts that people without an eating disorder have. So if you give them 
an SSRI or an SNRI or a TCA or something like that, they don't have that building blocks neurotransmitters to work with. So your first goal again is nutritional rehab and therapy and helping this person to start put back on some calories. SSRIs can be used for co-occurring psychiatric illnesses. So if someone has depression or an anxiety disorder and so on, but really you have to restore some of that weight first and get some calories and get some protein into that person before these will likely be effective. Antipsychotics may be used to aid in weight gain. So I was looking at a 2019 study uh, that looked at olanzapine versus placebo, and it showed that the patients on olanzapine with anorexia nervosa put on roughly one pound more per month. So that could help, like, like we were saying, in the weight gain, but this study didn't show um, that the olanzapine helped with the obsessionality around food or any of the psychopathological features. That being said, other studies have shown that antipsychotics can improve in that area. So due to the plus or not minus nature of the current evidence, uh, you would have to make that decision based on your current patient. Next, just one landmark clinical, cl clinical trial. So I like to introduce um, evaluating medical studies in medical literature because that's something that I do on a daily basis. So it can be helpful for you as well. Uh, this here is a Cochrane review, and a Cochrane review is uh, Cochrane is an organization based out of the UK. It's generally regarded as high quality evidence, and they have an official relationship with the World Health Organization. A Cochrane review is basically like a brand name of a meta analysis. So, this Cochrane review looked at seven randomized um, controlled trials, and they found no evidence to support the use of antidepressants in patients with anorexia nervosa. It didn't help the, with weight, um, core pathology, or associated pathology. So this goes back to what we're saying, someone who's a really low weight, you need to restore that weight before generally these medications can be helpful. Okay, one question for a knowledge check. Why are antidepressants not effective in the treatment of anorexia nervosa? So option A, the overuse of laxatives or exercise speeds metabolism to the point where little drug is absorbed. B, starvation limits the production of neurotransmitters and antidepressants re rely on neurotransmitters the body already has synthesized. Or C, antidepressants need food to be properly absorbed. Please feel free to, to pause if you want to think about it, but I'm going to go along to the answer, which is B, which I hope I stressed and highlighted a few times already but starvation limits the production of neurotransmitters. And again, our medications, especially antidepressants, rely on neurotransmitters that have already been made to exert their effects. Next is bulimia nervosa. Um, so bulimia nervosa includes repeated episodes of binge eating and then purging. So it's like this two-sided coin of eating disorders. It's difficult to recognize or diagnose because a lot of these behaviors are done um, secretively and people with bulimia nervosa are often a normal body weight. They have a normal BMI. The um, prevalence is again higher in females compared to males, which is also what we saw in anorexia. So this is easy to remember because it's a pattern. Peak age of onset, 16 to 19 year old, years old, so late teens, which is also what we saw in anorexia nervosa. So again, easy to remember because it's a pattern with these eating disorders. Average episode duration is three months, which is shorter than the average anorexia episode, which was eight months. Average duration of illness is years, and the mort mortality rate is still here at 1%, but it's a lot lower than it was for anorexia. The diagnostic criteria for bulimia nervosa can be seen here. The first component is recurrent episodes of binge eating. And what exactly is binge eating? So binge eating is eating any amount of food in a two-hour period that is definitely larger than what most individuals would consume over that time period. And the second component is a sense of lack of control during that episode. So that person can't control how much they eat and what types of food they're eating. And this feels like something that 
probably most people feel like they have done in their life. But when I looked into episodes of binge eating more, it seems really, really severe. It can be. So some episodes of binge eating can be up to 20,000 calories, which the average daily intake is 2,000. So you're eating 10 times that amount, which is, which is absolutely huge, as you would imagine. Um, binge eating... Binge eatings are often concealed, planned in advance. There's like this secretive component to them. People with binge eating disorder will often eat alone, uh, go somewhere else to eat, eat in their car, something like that. There's also, on the flip side of that rec um, binge eating, is there's inappropriate compensatory behaviors. So that can be self-induced vomiting. That can be misuse of medications like laxative diuretics and other medications. Um, that can be excessive exercise, anything to prevent weight gain from those binges. Um, the binge eating and compensatory behaviors must occur on average at least once weekly for at least three month time period. So this can't be like something that happens once or twice or every once a year or something like that. It has to be a really consistent um, behavioral pattern. Self-evaluation is undo, unduly influenced by body shape and weight. So again, that altered perception of what their body actually looks like. And the disturbance does not occur exclusively during episodes of anorexia nervosa. So they are different. Um, the severity of bulimia are, is based on the number of episodes per week. So remember, the severity of anorexia was based on BMI. So how low that person's weight was. But the severity of bulimia is how many episodes, how much they're binging and purging. Next is signs and symptoms. And this is similar to anorexia. So impulsivity. Um, so someone might impulsively go binge when they weren't meaning to eat or something like that. Um, someone might impulsively purge and go exercise for five hours after they eat. Someone might impulsively use substances, so whether that be a substance use disorder or using substances to help with their purge. There's mood lability, which can be seen in many um, mental illnesses. Substance use disorders we talked about, major depressive disorder, anxiety disorders. The physical manifestations aren't as, generally aren't as severe as what you see in anorexia as they are with bulimia here. So the body type is normal to slightly overweight. So remember, with anorexia, one of the key components is a low body weight, a low BMI, and that isn't the case with bulimia. Dental, you can see permanent loss of dental enamel. So this can happen in anorexia too if people are self-inducing vomiting and um, their stomach acid wears down the dental enamel over time. They can be tired. There's a dermatologic term called Russell's sign. And as you can see from the image here, it's basically calluses on the knuckles because that skin is relatively soft and soft and close to the bone. So um, if that person is self-inducing vomiting, repeat, repeated scrapes of those knuckles against the teeth can cause calluses. So it's something to look for if you're unsure of someone's behaviors and what they've been doing, if they have a potential eating disorder. Next is electrolyte disturbances which can be seen with bulimia, but generally they're less severe than they are with anorexia. And then there's reproductive changes and cardiac changes, which again can be serious and can be fatal. Bulimia nervosa treatment is seen here. Bulimia is generally treated on an outpatient level unless it's really, really severe. Whereas remember the first step with treating anorexia was to determine the level of care. Do they need to be inpatient or can they be treated outpatient? But with bulimia, these people are generally able to be treated outpatient. First line, the first two options are exactly the same as what they were for anorexia. So nutritional rehabilitation. So develop a structured meal plan um, and base that off of reducing the, the episodes of dietary restrictions, reduce the urges to binge and purge. So have some structure around meals. Next is therapy, which addresses all those same concerns with anorexia. So previous traumas, previous abuses, um, fears of food, uh, body image perception, so on. Where treatment changes here is first line, there's also a medication listed here. So a selective 
serotonin reuptake inhibitor, so an antidepressant, fluoxetine, is FDA approved for bulimia nervosa. And the first thing I look at or think about when I see that a medication can be used for a disorder and it's FDA approved is how effective is it? And uh, fluoxetine seems to be pretty effective for bulimia nervosa. So one trial I looked at, um, it decreased the number of binge eating and purging episodes by 70%, which is huge. Um, the dosing here, generally you want to get to the higher end and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but higher doses of fluoxetine can be more effective. Next is some second line options medication wise. So if fluoxetine can't be used or didn't work, you can try a different SSRI. Um, some options here are fluvoxamine or sertraline. And there's also additional options. So topiramate has been shown to help with both the binging and purging episodes, but generally it's thought of as something that potentially helps more with the binge eating component. Um, on Dancitron, I found a few small trudy trials related to on Dancitron. They had relative, they were small, like I said, one study was around five, the other was around 14 people, the other was around, it was in the 20s, but all relatively low numbers. And they used on Dancitron as almost like a PRN, which means as needed. So if someone felt the urge to have a binge eating episode, they would take an on Dancitron. And although the studies were small, so that is a limitation, it basically cut the binge eating episodes in half. So it's a potential option. Landmark clinical trial. So again, I like to go a little bit into the evidence and review some of the evidence, but I won't spend too much time on that during this lecture. But the trial I wanted to highlight here was, it's old, it's from 1992, but it looked at fluoxetine 60, which is a relatively high dose, fluoxetine 20, which is a relatively low dose versus placebo. And what this trial found was that fluoxetine 60 was the most effective, fluoxetine 20 was the next, and then placebo was not effective. So the point I'm trying to make here is that dosing matters, matters when using fluoxetine for bulimia nervosa. Okay, one knowledge check here. How do you dif differentiate between anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa? Option A, bulimia nervosa includes self-induced vomiting and anorexia does not. B, bulimia nervosa is often curable and anorexia nervosa is not. C, anorexia nervosa includes a restriction of energy intake that leads to a significantly lowered body weight and bulimia nervosa does not. So again, feel free to pause if you want to think about it, but otherwise I'm going to continue along. And the answer is C. So the main differentiating factor between anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa is the body weight. Um, someone with anorexia has a low BMI. Um, they restrict their energy intake to the degree where they have a low BMI. Someone with anorexia can still have binging and can still have purging, but again, they're doing that to the point where they're losing more calories than they're gaining and their BMI is low, whereas bulimia does not have that component. So there's the binging and purging with bulimia, but there's not that loss in weight in BMI. Okay, the final um, eating disorder we'll cover in depth is binge eating disorder. And uh, overall, what this is, is recurrent binge eating episodes, which we already talked about. So eating uh, more over a two hour period than most people would be able to. And um, the second component is loss of control. And then the binges are often followed by like depression or despair or feelings of guilt. So the prevalence is again higher in females compared to males, and the peak age of onset is the late teens. So again, this coincides with the other two eating disorders, and so does the prevalence. So all three eating disorders we talked about had a higher prevalence in females. All three had a peak age of onset in the late teens. Long-term complications with binge eating disorder are related to obesity. So they can be things like high blood pressure, uh, pre-diabetes, diabetes, high cholesterol, risk of stroke, so on. Any of the risks that you would have from having a high weight are the same risks from binge eating disorder. One of the thing I wanted to comment on was differentiating binge eating disorder from obesity. 
So they definitely do overlap to a degree, but they are not the same. So approximately 50% of obese individuals report symptoms of binge eating. How you differentiate this is, is the overeating due to loss of control? If it is, that could be binge eating disorder. And is the, and following the binge eating, is there depression, despair, guilt, anything like that? That can be binge eating. And that's one of the ways you can differentiate obesity between binge eating disorder. DSM-5 criteria can be seen here. So this is the true diagnostic criteria um, for binge eating disorder. So first, recurrent episodes of binge eating, which we already talked about. And then the binge eating episodes are associated with three or more of the following. Eating much more rapidly than normal, um, eating until feeling uncomfortably full, eating large amounts when not hungry, eating alone because of feeling embarrassed, feeling disgusted, depressed, or guilty after eating. And then again, this can't just be a one-off type of behavior. It has to be repeated. So at least once a week for three months. These signs and symptoms can be seen here uh, psychiatrically, which go along with anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. So impulsivity, mood lability, substance use, major depressive disorder, anxiety disorders, components of OCD, anything like that. The physical manifestations, so the body weight or the body type here is generally overweight. Um, the physical manifestations are again, those that are related to obesity. So hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, um, increased risk of stroke, increased risk of, risk of heart attack, so on. The treatment guidelines have been reviewed and we'll talk about them here. So the first line treatment is nutritional rehabilitation and therapy. So again, one of the easy things about eating disorders is there's a lot of patterns. So these first two components, nutritional rehabilitation and therapy are first line for anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder. So it's easy to remember. First line here is also an, an SSRI can be used. So like fluoxetine that we talked about with bulimia. Second line, there's a few options. So there's tapiramate that we already talked about. Uh, zanisamide can be used for binge eating. And then tricyclic antidepressants sometimes can as well. There's also some evidence for naltrexone, and atomoxetine, which is a medication used for ADHD. But the final medication, which is the only FDA approved option, is Listexamphetamine, which is brand name is Vyvanse. And this is a C2 stimulant medication. So this is also FDA approved for ADHD. One thing you have to worry about this is it is a controlled medication, it's C2. So it can be abused, it can be um, sold, can be traded, anything like that. So you have to watch out for addiction and um, misuse. That being said, so this is the only FDA approved option, but remember based on the guidelines, it wasn't generally a first line option. So you would wait until someone has tried therapy, nutritional rehab, and then an SSRI, and then you would go to this as a potential second line option. The landmark clinical trial I wanted to talk about here looked at the effectiveness of listexamphetamine. And if you look at the results, it does seem to be fairly effective. So this was looking at people relapsing and 3.7% of people on the listexamphetamine relapsed into having binge eating disorder symptoms, whereas 32% on placebo relapsed. So only a small amount, that 3.7% relapsed, whereas on placebo, a third of people relapsed. So that can be really effective and that can be really helpful. So the knowledge check here is what is the first line medication? So I'm specifically asking for the medication that's first line for binge eating disorder. Your options are sertraline, listexamphetamine, topiramate, or amitriptyline. And you can pause if you wanna wait and try to figure it out for yourself but the first line option is SSRIs. And again, I wanted to highlight this because there's only one FDA approved medication, the listexamphetamine, but based on the guidelines, SSRIs are still used first. Listexamphetamine can be used as a second line treatment. Okay, so let's summarize a little bit. And this slide here compares the eating disorders. So anorexia nervosa, people are underweight. They have a low BMI. That's a uh, component of diagnosing it. Bulimia nervosa, average weight. 
binge eating disorder overweight. Anorexia nervosa, the core things associated with it, is a calorie deficit, and it can have binging or purging. Bulimia nervosa has to have binging and purging, and binge eating disorder can only have binging. So I hope that that helps to organize your thoughts around these three different types of eating disorders. To conclude, there's not robust clinical trials. So there's some decent data and there's that Cochrane review I reviewed and some smaller end studies, but these aren't at the scale of depression studies or schizophrenia studies. They're, they're much smaller, much, uh, there's, there's large gaps of years in between some of these trials. The next thing I wanted to conclude with is remember first line, all three had nutritional rehabilitation and therapy. And then for certain illnesses and certain cases, you can choose medications. Patients require support from several areas. So their therapist, their doctor, so they need medical support, they need psychiatric support, they need support from their family, uh, they need support from a dietitian or a nutritionist. So um, just like how this disease is caused multifactorial by many things, you need support in different areas. I wanted to wrap up with two patient cases. So the first case is a 19 year old woman states that she eats large quantities of food and then takes laxatives and exercises to counteract the food. The patient has been doing that twice weekly for a year. Otherwise she eats a normal diet and her BMI is average for her height. What treatment do you recommend? A fluoxetine, B bupropion, C less list dexamphetamine or D, D topiramate. So feel free to pause if you wanna think about it, but I'm going to go through how I think about it. So first you need to determine what her diagnosis most likely is to answer this question. So you can take it line by line. A 19 year old woman states that she eats large quantities of food. So that first component eats large quantities of food could be anorexia can have binging, bulimia can have binging, and binge eating disorder can have binging. So that doesn't help us at this point. The next part, and then takes laxatives and exercises to counteract the food. So now they added in a purging component, which can still be anorexia or bulimia, but this eliminates binge eating disorder. She's been doing that twice weekly for a year, so it meets the duration component and frequency component. Otherwise, she eats a normal diet and her BMI is average. So this is what we were looking for to finalize it. So someone with anorexia can have binging and purging, but their BMI is not average. So we're able to eliminate anorexia and this person most likely has bulimia. Then um, based on these treatments, we're looking for a medication clearly. So for bulimia, one medication is approved and the most appropriate, and that is fluoxetine 20 milligrams daily. Our goal then would be to get that person to a higher dose, preferably around 60 based on that trial that I showed you. Next is patient case two. A 16 year old presents for treatment of amenorrhea for one year. On physical exam, her weight is 68% of that expected for her age and weight. When this is mentioned, the patient said she looks fat and cannot gain any more weight. She has mild hypokalemia and her blood pressure is 78 over 58 and her heart rate is 52. Which treatments would you recommend? Select all that apply. So again, feel free to pause, but let's go into the breakdown. So amenorrhea, so again, she's having a hypoestrogenic state. Um, someone with, as I'll announce, has anorexia. Someone with anorexia can have hormonal changes, amenorrhea. Her weight is 68% of what's expected, so she has that low BMI component. And um, the next point here is she has mild hypokalemia. She has a really low blood pressure and a soft heart rate. So which treatments would you recommend? The first option is fluoxetine 20, which in someone with anorexia at a low body weight, this is likely to not be effective, so this isn't the option. List dexamphetamine, you would never give a stimulant that suppresses appetite to someone with a low body weight and anorexia nervosa, so this is not the correct options. Nutritional rehabilitation and therapy, option C or D, are an option for any eating disorder, so correct, correct. And then option E, hospital admission. This person probably needs hospitalized due to having hypokalemia, 
really low blood pressure and heart rate. So they're having electrolyte disturbances, they're having cardiac disturbances, and something severe could happen. So the bottom three are the recommendations for this particular patient with most likely anorexia nervosa. I hope that that presentation was helpful in learning and talking about eating disorders, specifically anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder. And thank you so much for watching.